Chapter 3. The Early Middle Ages. Article 1. General Historical Survey, 5th to the 11th Centuries. The Teutonic Invasions. The period of the early Middle Ages may be said to extend from about the middle of the 5th century to the pontificate of Pope Gregory VII, who died in 1085, the reign of the Emperor Honorius, 395 to 423, had witnessed the beginning of the last struggles of the Roman Empire in Western Europe. From across the Danube, the Goths overran Italy, Gaul, and Spain, the Saxons, Jutes, and Angles, crossing the North Sea from the region south of Denmark, swarmed into Britain. The Alemanni, Franks, Burgundians, and later on the Lombards, advance from beyond the Rhine, while from the plains of the Vistula, the fierce Vandals, and the savage race of the Huns poured over Western and Southern Europe. Before the close of the 5th century, the Western Empire was finally dissolved. The Goths were ruling in Spain and the Vandals in Africa. The Franks had obtained mastery in Gaul and along the basin of the Rhine. Soon after, the Lombards definitely established their power in northern Italy and the Anglo-Saxons in Britain. Many of these nations, including the Franks, Burgundians, and Anglo-Saxons, were pagan. The Vandals, Lombards, Alemanni, and Goths were Christian only in name. They professed Arianism, a debased form of Christianity, in which the mysteries of the Holy Trinity and the incarnation of the Son of God were rejected. Ireland and the Barbarians Meanwhile, during the second half of the 5th century, the Irish people, who had remained outside the Roman Empire and were not touched by the barbarian invasions, had been converted to Christianity, and in a short time the Christian spirit had permeated the laws and social customs of the nation. During the three centuries that ensued, while confusion and turmoil reigned on the continent, Ireland became the principal depository in Europe of the Christian tradition. From Ireland, most of the missionaries came that labored during the 6th and 7th centuries for the conversion of the barbarian conquerors of Western Europe, both pagan and Aryan, to Christianity. Conversion of the Barbarians By the end of the 8th century, the nations west of the Danube and Rhine, including Britain, and 200 years later, practically all Europe, with the exception of the Moors in the southern half of Spain, had accepted the Christian faith. But the work of bringing the laws and social life of the converted nations into harmony with Christian principles was a more tedious and difficult task, and much of the pagan spirit and outlook continued to live on among them for centuries after they had nominally embraced Christianity. Eighth and two following centuries. The work of the church was rendered more difficult by the disturbed state of Europe, and especially by the rise of the Mohammedan power and the invasions of the Norsemen, Hungarians, and Slavs. In the early half of the 8th century, the Mohammedan Moors established their power in Spain and continued to push their way into France to the wave of invasion was finally broken by Charles Martel on the field of Tours, A.D. 732. Soon after, the pagan Norsemen and Danes began their wars of conquest in the north. These wars continued for more than two centuries and extended even to Italy and Sicily. The Norsemen broke up the civil and ecclesiastical organization in northern France, Belgium, Ireland, and England before they were themselves won over to Christianity in the 11th century. Meanwhile, from the east, the Slavs, still half pagan, carried on a fierce war against the Christian states on their borders, while the fierce race of the Magyars or Hungarians began in the 8th century their terrible incursions into central Germany and northern Italy. All these wars impeded the civilizing influence of Christianity and delayed for more than two centuries the formation of Christendom. Article 2. Social Regeneration of the Barbarians influence of ecclesiastics. During the whole of this period, the Catholic Church was the one power in Europe that stood for human right and liberty. As the nations became Christian, 
the Pope gradually gained recognition as a delegate of God, who is the source of all legitimate authority. Hence, he became the official advisor and admonitor of Christian rulers, the mediator between the rulers and the people, and the arbiter in international affairs. The local bishops and abbots, and even individual priests, exercised, each in his own limited sphere, an influence similar to that which the popes possessed in Christendom as a whole. For in those days intellectual training, at least outside of the Greek Empire and of Ireland, was practically confined to the clergy and the monks. Thus it was, from the church's representatives, the pope, the bishops, and the clergy, that the serf, the slave, the poor, and the weak sought and obtained protection against wrong. End of Christian Teaching Historians generally recognize that it was as a result of Christian teaching and the church's influence that the barbarian nations were gradually molded to that sense of justice, charity, and true liberty, which formed the basis of medieval civilization. Leo XIII strongly emphasizes this fact. Christian Europe has subdued barbarous nations and changed them from a savage to a civilized condition from superstition to true worship. It victoriously rolled back the tide of Mohammedan conquest, retained the headship of civilization, stood forth in the front ranks as the leader and teacher of all in every branch of national culture, bestowed on the world the gift of true and many-sided liberty, the most wisely founded very numerous institutions for the solace of human suffering. Whatever in the state is of chief avail for the common welfare, whatever has been usefully established to curb the license of rulers, who are opposed to the true interests of the people, or to keep in check the leading authorities from unwarranted interference in municipal or family affairs, whatever tends to uphold the honor, manhood, and equal rights of individual citizens, of all these things, as the monuments of past age bear witness, the Catholic Church has always been the originator, the promoter, or the guardian. It was the Church that checked the tyranny and absolutism of the ruler while teaching the subjects the duty of submission and obedience to lawful authority, thus pointing out to all the path leading to social happiness and peace. It was from the Church's teaching and admonitions that the wealthy and powerful baron learned his duties of justice and charity towards his vassals and serfs, while the latter, from the same teaching, became conscious of their dignity as children of God, and realized the indefeasible rights they had, no less than the prince or the feudal baron, to a fair share even of a temporal well-being. Formation of a Christian Civilization All the complicated organization, which was gradually built up all over Europe, in the interests of the poor, the aged, the infirm, and the young, hospitals, asylums, orphanages, houses of refuge, etc., was the work of the church alone. The church, writes Lecky, which seemed so haughty and overbearing in its dealings with kings and princes and nobles, never failed to listen to the poor and the oppressed, and for many centuries their protection was the foremost of all the objects of her policy. Again, it was the church that purified the home and restored and safeguarded the dignity of the women, so closely identified with the purity and happiness of domestic life. Restoration of the Arts and Sciences It was by churchmen that the literary treasures of ancient Greece and Rome were preserved, and science and letters propagated among the people. The mechanical arts, too, such as masonry, carpentry, ironwork, etc., as well as agriculture, forestry, fishery, which are so essential for material prosperity, were restored throughout Europe principally by the means of the church. Even for the foundation of the great public utilities, schools, universities, banks, insurance companies, roads, bridges, etc., which had practically disappeared over most of Europe as a result of the barbarian invasions, we are indebted to activities of the church special Christian institutions and achievements. Among the Christian institutions and practices specially beneficial 
were the practice of sacramental confession, the discipline of the penitential canons, the enforcing of the unity and perpetuity of the marriage contract, the institution of the peace of God, and the prohibition of usury. It is outside our scope to treat these matters in detail. A few points, however, which refer directly to social well-being require special notice. These concern monasticism, the abolition of slavery, and the charity of the church. The question of usury will be dealt with later. Article 3. Monasticism. Its Great Importance. In the history of monasticism, during this period will be found perhaps the most striking illustration of the church's beneficent influence. It was largely through the medium of her monastic institutions that the church evangelized the Teutonic nations and fashioned their social life to Christian ideals. From the 6th century onward, the Benedictine and Irish monks spread over every country of Western Europe, and every district on mountain and valley, near the seashore, and in inland regions, their monasteries were to be seen. These formed the centers of the organized religion of the neighborhood. It was the monasteries and convents of nuns that relieved the poor, reared the orphans, cared for the sick, afforded shelter to the traveler, and were havens of refuge for all who were weighed down by spiritual or corporal suffering. Its influence on social customs. The example of self-abnegation in the monk's life the object lesson in human equality with the democratic spirit of their institute afforded, the ideals of cooperation embodied in their corporate organization, their charity, their attitude towards their dependents and the poor, all exercised a profound influence on social customs. The example of the monks gave a prestige to manual labor, which, among the barbarians, as in pagan Greece and Rome, was previously esteemed unworthy of a free man. Every Benedictine and Columbian monk, including the abbot, who in the people's eyes had the status of a feudal lord, was bound by rule to spend many hours a day in manual labor in the fields or in his workshop. As a result of the monk's example, a lay artisan class of free men was gradually formed, preparing the way for the subsequent city guild organizations. On Agriculture, the Handicrafts and Art it was the monks, too, who introduced into Europe the art of agriculture and brought the land back again to cultivation. In the last centuries of the Roman Empire, agriculture had fallen into disuse, and it disappeared almost entirely as a result of the Teutonic invasions. Most of the lands given over to the monasteries were uncultivated and unappropriated at the time of the donation. The monks cultivated them with their own hands. In course of time, immense tracts of country were thus reclaimed. Marshes were drained, forests cleared, roads made through the cultivated territory, bridges built, and all the equipment of civilized life gradually reappeared. A tradition of highly skilled agriculture and of proficiency in handicraft, as well as in fishery, forestry, horticulture, etc., was developed in the monasteries and from the monasteries these arts got diffused among the people. Though agriculture and gardening, writes Lucky, were the forms of labor in which the monks especially excelled, they indirectly became the authors of every other. For when a monastery was planted, it soon became a nucleus around which the inhabitants of the neighborhood clustered. A town was thus gradually formed, civilized by Christian teaching, stimulated to industry, by the example of the monks and protected by the reverence that attached to them. At the same time, the ornamentation of the church gave the first impulse to art. Thus, not only agriculture and the kindred arts, but architecture also, as well as painting, sculpture, and music, were renewed in medieval Europe by the initiative and example of the monks. On letters and science, again, the monasteries were the schools of learning. In fact, outside of Ireland, where, besides the monastic schools, a system of education existed independent of the church, the monasteries were, during all these centuries, the sole custodians of literary and scientific knowledge in Europe. 
It was in the monasteries, too, that historical records began to be kept. It was by the monks, and especially by the Irish monks, that the people were taught to cultivate their own national languages, thus laying the foundation of modern European literature. The monasteries, as well as the Carlovingian schools, established by Charlemagne in the beginning of the ninth century, under the influence and inspiration of the church, were the parent stems from which the great medieval schools and universities of Europe afterwards developed. Article 4. Abolition of Slavery. Church's Efforts on Behalf of Slaves. The Teutonic invasions had been calamitous for the slaves. Slavery, now, became much more widespread, and slave loss many of the privileges which had been secured for them during the preceding century. As the nations became Christian, the church again intervened in their behalf. It procured the liberation of large numbers of slaves in every country. Documents of the 5th, 6th, and 7th centuries contain numerous records of captives who had been reduced to slavery, being redeemed by bishops, priests, monks, and pious laymen. Such redeemed captives were sometimes sent back in thousands to their own country. During all these centuries, enactments were constantly made in the national and provincial councils of the church and the interests of the slaves, providing for the protection of maltreated slaves and for the help and patronage of those that were liberated, securing the validity of the marriages of slaves, enforcing in their interests rests on Sundays and feast days forbidding or limiting traffic in slaves, and forbidding that freemen be reduced to slavery. Development of Slavery into Serfdom But the Church's beneficent influence is best illustrated in her treatment of the slaves employed on the ecclesiastical estates, which eventually led to the abolition of slavery in Christendom. In the early centuries of this period, the Church, owing to several causes, found itself in the possession of immense estates in every country of Europe. The immediate owners of these estates were the Pope himself, the bishops, the cathedral or collegiate chapters, and the monasteries. By virtue of a 4th century statute of Roman law, due to the influence of the church, rural slaves could not be removed from the lands on which they worked, even when the lands passed to another owner. This law was revoked after the barbarian invasions except for slaves belonging to ecclesiastical estates. Hence the latter, whose numbers were immense, had the privilege of fixed work and permanent homes. By a whole series of canonical enactments, the position of these slaves was gradually improved, and the privileges enjoyed by the ecclesiastical slaves were gradually extended to those belonging to the lay lords. The result was that about the 10th century European slavery had practically given way to serfdom. We shall see later how tolerable was the position of the medieval serf as compared with that of the slave or of the modern proletarian laborer. Especially on the immense ecclesiastical estates, the serf or villain was treated with peculiar liberality. Here again, the standard set up in ecclesiastical estates gradually spread to the lay manners preparing the way for the eventual development of serfdom into peasant proprietorship. Article 5. Charity of the Church. Its Influence on Feudal System. Besides the relief which the monasteries provided for the poor and the weak, the Church, which always regarded the corporal works of mercy among her primary functions, made provision for their wants in several other ways. The feudal system, which had developed in Europe during these centuries and dominated the whole social life of the Middle Ages, became largely permeated by Christian principles, and the relations between lord, vassal, and serf were strongly imbued with the Christian spirit. King, prince, and feudal lord were constantly reminded that they held their offices from God, and were responsible to God for the welfare of those under their charge. The poor, the weak, and the helpless were in theory, and to a large extent in practice, objects of their special care. Thus, by Charlemagne's legislation, around 800, the feudal lord was charged with the duty of caring for all the needy among his own vassals, according to St. Paul's principle, that everyone should attend to the needs of his own household. 
the patrimony of the poor. Besides the legal provisions in the feudal system in favor of the poor and the weak, there existed, from the early centuries of the church, many other provisions for the relief of distress. All the church revenues, even the sacred vessels, were regarded as subject to the demands of charity. Ecclesiastical property was referred to as the patrimony of the poor, and a fourth part of all ecclesiastical revenue was always set apart for this object. Charitable Organizations and Institutions Collections were regularly made for the same purpose in the churches. The wealthy and the powerful constantly contributed large portions of their property. The administration of charity was carried out by regular parochial organizations under the presidency of the bishops. Besides, there existed in almost every city from earliest times parochial institutions called Xenodokia, which were under the control of the bishops. These, which had begun in the time of Constantine, were meant originally for widows, the poor, the homeless, abandoned children, and other helpless classes. They were commonly managed by pious associations and were endowed from ecclesiastical property. Conclusion Between the charitable works of the monasteries, the recognized duty of the feudal lords, and the parochial organizations to meet the needs of the poor, destitution and misery were always tolerably provided for. Hence, it is certain that even during the darkest period of the early Middle Ages, amid almost universal warfare and violence, pauperism never reached the appalling proportions which it assumed in England and Ireland in the 18th and 19th and even the 20th centuries. Although these countries then enjoyed peace and England abounded in wealth.